Okay, this is a preview for section 4.1 and appendix B. And a big theme in section 4.1 is we're going to try to calculate things like areas under curves or total distance traveled given velocity, where things are changing, where my curve's not constant or my velocity's not constant. And that can be a hard problem to do. And so our trick is going to be to chop up whatever we're trying to calculate into little tiny pieces where we can approximate it easily and then add back up our total approximations to get the overall answer. So as part of that, we're going to be adding a bunch of different terms, similar to what I have in something like this, and we're gonna need a new notation. So we're gonna introduce what's called sigma notation. So this is just gonna help us be more efficient when I'm trying to write out large sums. So one thing before we write sigma notation is in this particular problem, notice that I can pull out a two just factor it out from each one. And then I'm left with one plus four plus nine plus 16 plus 100. Okay, so based on this, I want you to see if you could tell me what is the term that should come next, like right here, and see what, what's the overall pattern. So put this on pause. Okay, so if you guess 25, you're right, that would be the next one, because I'm noticing that this first term is one squared, this first term is two squared, this is three squared, four squared, all the way up to 10 squared. And so how, first we can write this out and actually calculate it if we wanted to do all 10 terms. And in that case, I'll get 770. But in general, we're gonna teach you a more succinct notation and a more succinct way to add these things up so you don't have to add up large sums like this. So without using some nice tricks. Uh, so the first thing we're gonna do is start to call these different terms. So I'm gonna call this one the first term, the second term, and then I'm gonna give a general variable. You can use any, we typically might use i, sometimes we use n, sometimes we use k. It's just so that we're allowed to show you a general formula. And so what I'd like to do now is write this in sigma notation. So I'm gonna write this symbol first. This is telling me to sum up things. And then what goes inside here is gonna tell me what each term should be. So each term, the first, uh, each term has a two. I can see that for sure. And then notice the first term is just one squared. The second term is just two squared. The ith term should be i squared. So what I'm gonna put inside here is i squared. And then you, this down below tells you where you start i. So I'm gonna start, you can see here, my very first term is when i is one, and I'm gonna end when i is 10. And this is what I mean by this notation. So this still doesn't tell us how to add it up. I still had to write out all the 10 terms in order to actually get the 770. We're gonna learn a little trick later to help us with that. But for right now, this is just a shorthand way for me to express this sum. So now I want you to look at these three sums, put this on pause for a second, and write out what it means, like what each of these terms are you'd be adding up. And in the cases where it's possible, give me what the total sum would be. Okay, so you should have for the first one, your i starts at two, so you should have started at two squared, it ends at six, so your last one should have been six squared, and then you should have had a total of one, two, three, four, five, five terms, adding up to 90. This one, I'm starting at three, I'm ending at eight, so I'll have six terms total, where the first term is three times three plus one, which is 10, and the last one is eight times three plus one, which is 25. And then lastly here, a is just a constant. So if I wanted, I could have pulled a out because it's not changing at all as I am adding things. So it's kind of like up above when I pulled two out from the beginning. And I could have written it like this. This is equivalent as well. And then I would recommend getting a common denominator here just so we can see how this all relates. So this is a to the fourth plus a to the eighth plus a to the 16th. And if I get a common denominator of 16 on each of them, I get seven a over 16. All right, so now we're gonna go backwards. So again, put this on pause, and I would like for you to come up with a sigma formula for each of these three sums. And I'll point out right now, there's more than one way to do this correctly. So in the answer I'm about to show, if for some reason yours doesn't match up, it doesn't mean yours is necessarily wrong. There's a lot of different ways to be able to write these. But go ahead, put it on pause, and see what you can come up with.
Okay, the first one, this is actually usually the trickiest for everybody. So if you were feeling stumped on the first one, you're not alone. Uh, what I'd remind myself is here, this is the first term. So like if I want, I could call I is one, I is two, I is three. And what I'm noticing is that the numbers I put in doesn't depend on I. I just want a six back every time. So what the only part where I is going to come in is to tell me how many sixes I'm going to add up. When I is one, I want one six, like this. When I is one, I'd have six, but I want to keep going. So I want it to be two, three, and I want it to stop at four. So this is one way to write it. And notice that way I get the same thing back every time. Okay, this next one, uh, there's lots of different ways to do these. I would say if you want, we could pull a two out again, because there's a two in each of these that might help us. Uh, you don't have to do that to start, but let's say we do. Let's say we pull out a 2. So now I'm getting 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus... Ooh, and that made it kind of nice to see the pattern when I did it that way. Because now I'm going to end up... This will go to 37. And now I'm noticing this is the same as... A couple options. I know I have a 2 in here. If I want to start my counter at 1, which I can... Um, I would write it. Let's think how I would write this. Well, let me actually back up and show you a trick I do sometimes. If you notice, it'd be easier to not start when i equals 1. And you don't have to start when i equals 1. So a lot of times, if it's obvious to me, I'm like, I'd rather start when i is 2. And then, notice what I'm going to get. So then I'm going to get 2, and then I just realized I'm multiplying by i, because that will give me each of my terms. I would start at 2 and it would just end at 37. So that's a nice quick way to do it. But let's say you say, you know what, I'd rather really start this when i is equal to one. Here's my trick. So I rewrite this, but instead of putting i equals two, I put what I really would want to have. So I really want something equaling one, right? But I don't wanna change this value. So if I have i equals two, that's the same as I could subtract one, i minus one equaling one. I just subtracted one from both sides so that this side eventually equaled one. And so I'm going to rewrite this as i minus one equaling one. Now I'm going to do a little replacement. And so I'm going to call this whole thing, let's just call it a new variable, I'm going to call it k. So k is equal to i minus one, which means that i will be k plus one. And so now I'm going to replace everything and put it in terms of k. So my i that I have inside here becomes k plus 1. And then my final sigma, I'll write it like this, is k is equal to 1. Oh, and my, oh, I'll see what my top needs to be also. We'll see how that fix adjusts at the end. This is 2 times k plus 1. And then we double check where I would need to end. So what k value is going to give me a 74 at the end? And I can see that's going to happen if I take 74, divide it by 2, I'm getting 37, then subtract 1, I'd be getting 36. So my top value would be going to 36. Here I have it as a question mark still because I haven't figured it out, but then my final one's here. So you don't always have to do this, only if we tell you we want you to start at a certain counter. Um, this one is just as equivalent, this is fine. But sometimes it's better, um, depending on what we tell you, sometimes you have to start at a specific counter. All right, and let's try the last one. All right, so this last one, there's nothing I can factor out they have in common. I'm just gonna look at how I'm moving from term to term. I'm adding two, adding two, adding two all the way. So that's telling me I should have a two i somewhere in here because I know I'm increasing by two, at least, as I move up in i. And then to figure out how you adjust this, let's decide, let's decide we want my counter to start at one. It doesn't have to, but if I want my counter to start at one, I'd figure out what do I need to add to this so that when I plug in 1 for i, I get 3. And I can see I just need to add a 1. And then you just check. Try it for a couple ones. So this should be when i is equal to 3. I just want to come back and check. Do I get 7? And yes, I do. 2 times 3 plus 1 7. So I know that's good. And then I want to figure out 51. So how high do I go up? So I actually just said you could solve this way. 2i plus 1, which means that 50 is equal to 2i, that means your top i up here should be 25. 
Okay, so notice in each of these, I haven't actually added all these terms up. I haven't sat there on my calculator and added them up. I've just written them in shorthand notation. And now we're going to learn some tricks for how we can actually add them up quicker than doing this one by one on our calculator. Okay, so we're, this is a super basic one that I could actually calculate by hand, but I'm going to use it to show you a quicker way to do these if we had much longer sums. So first let's write this in sigma notation. So I'm just, I'm noticing my first term is 1, my second term is 2, so each term is just i. And here I'm starting from 1 and I'm going to 5. All right, what's a quick way to be able to add these up? Now granted, I could just do it in my head, 5 plus 4 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1. But what if I wanted you to add up like the first 100 terms or the first 200 terms or the first 1,000 terms? You don't want to sit there and do all that. So I want to show you a cool pattern. Notice, let's do it geometrically first. Okay, so let's suppose we're going to try to do this in general. i equals 1 up to n of just adding up the first n terms. And let's look at a table. This is when we're doing it for five terms, right, which means I have... 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5, which I know is giving me 15. Let's look at it from a picture. So over here, I can notice if I just add up the first term, so just 1, it's like shading just the area of this top left part of the box. And then if I have 1 plus 2, well, so that would be like adding the first and the second rows. And then 1 plus 2 plus 3 is like adding this, the shaded area in the first three rows and then the first four rows, and then all five rows. But notice that this area of the shaded region is just one half, area of the shaded region is one half the area of the rectangle, which is this case five rows times six columns. So that's how I'm getting back to my 15. So I could use this trick in general because if I asked you, for example, to add up the first 100 terms, what would you give me? Well, notice I was asking to do the first five terms, and we ended up with 5 times 6 divided by 2. I'm going to have 100 times 101. Whoops, 101 divided by 2. And so in general, if I want to do this for n terms, I have n times n plus 1 divided by 2. And so now I'm going to show you one more cool trick as to how you could do this if you wanted to add up i squared. And then we'll go back to the very first problem we looked at and see how we could have done that really quickly. Okay, now I don't have a cool visual for this second one, but I have a nice way of thinking about it. So let's just write out the first few terms. So if, if I was only going to do this for the first term, I would just get 1. If n was 2, I'd have 1 squared plus 2 squared, which is 5. If n was 3, I'd have 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared, which is giving me 14. If n was 4... I'd end up getting 30, and if n was 5, I'd get 55. And as a side note while I'm doing this, this little trick I'm showing you here, we're only going to do once. Like, you're going to be able to use this formula that we just derived, and we'll use it a ton in the next couple weeks. And now we're going to derive it for this one, and you'll get to use this formula. So this little trick that I'm doing with the table is just a one-time thing to show you where these come from. Okay, so let's call this sum of the first n terms a. And let's call this sum of the first n term squared b. And then just to see, notice what happens. There's a little pattern here that falls out. Notice what happens if you do deep b divided by a in each of these cases. So in the first case, I just get 1 divided by 1. That's just 1. In the second case, I am getting 5 divided by 3. 5 divided by 3. In the third case, I am getting 14 divided by 6, which I could also think of as 7 divided by 3. In the fifth case, I am getting 30 divided by 10, which is the same as 3, but I could also think of that as 9 over 3. So I think you might be seeing the pattern here, and it might make the pattern easier to see if we rewrite this 1 over 1 as 3 over 3. So let's do that. And then you'll notice that my numerator are these odd powers starting at 3, and my denominator is always 3. And so we can write this now in general, if I was going to do this all the way down to n. Notice when n is 1, I have 3. When n is 2, I have 5. When n is 3, I have 7, and then 9. So this is 2 times n plus 1. That's how we get odd numbers in the numerator. 
and just try it. When n is 1, I get 3. When n is 2, I get 5. Okay, so this looks good. And this is equal to not the final sum that I want. This is equal to b divided by a. So let's write that here. This is b divided by a. And so I can go back and solve then for what I actually want because I know this is a and I'd like to solve for b. So this means that b is 2n plus 1 divided by 3 times a and a is n times n plus 1 divided by 2. So I can put this all here and I get n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 all divided by 6. And you say, okay, so what? <laughs> Well, now let's go back to that very first problem we started with. On the first page, we had this sum, 2i squared from i equals 1 to 10. And I told you what the answer was, but now we can actually see. This is the same as 2 times i equals 1 to 10 of i squared. But we know this formula. If i have i equals 1 to n of i squared, it's n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6, this bottom piece here. So let's write that in, 2, at two out front times, and my n in this case is 10, so I'm going to have 10 times 11 times 2n, so that's 20, or 20, and then plus 1, 21, all over 6. And when you plug that in, you will see that in fact does get us back to the 770 that we got by adding it up term by term. So this is going to be a nice shortcut that we use frequently during this class. That's just a little preview. If you want more practice, with trying to use these shortcuts to help you add sums together and you can see the rest of the handout that I have available and practice on there.